Agents Podcast. I love this quote. The single most effective way to sell anything to anyone, and this is, doesn't, isn't just 2022, is to be a problem finder and thus a problem solver, not a product pusher, a.k.a. having sales breath. And so many of us in this industry are guilty of that. We rush to social media. We rush out into the world to tell everybody what we do, to ask for their referrals, to ask for business, when in reality, you should be going about it a completely different way. And our guest today is going to help us with this. He is a chairman of, of Seventh Level, a global sales training company who was in the top 5,000 on Inc. Magazine's list of the fastest growing companies in 2021. He's been recognized by the Direct Selling Association as the 45th highest earning producer out of more than 100 million salespeople. I didn't even know that existed. He's the host of the podcast, Closers Are Losers. I, I like that. And his new book, The New Model of Selling, Selling to an Unsellable Generation, is coming out uh, right now. And, and we're, we're going to talk about things like how behavioral science and human psychology plays into sales. I love this. Yeah. Uh, and I'm excited to have this conversation today. Welcome to the show, Jeremy Miner. Jeff, hey, thanks for having me on. I'm going to take all of that as a compliment. My kids always say I'm pretty boring. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, so I was, you know, I had a 17 year sales career before I retired and then started seventh level. And that was my ranking because you, you get ranked by outside organizations in like the sales uh, direct selling um, industry. There's like 108 million salespeople in that industry. And and that was a, a good ranking. I was uh, privileged to partake in for several years in a row before I retired. So it was it was a lot of fun. Help a lot of people find and solve their problems. That's what it's all about. Before you retired, yeah, uh, you can't be that old, Jeremy. I'm I'm you know you're a guy, so I'm not afraid to ask. Yeah, how old are you? And, and when did you retire? I just turned forty five. And uh, I, we got good genes in the family. Everybody in my family looks 10 years younger. Everybody's like, dude, I thought you were 35. I'm like, no, I'm 45. But that's the way it is. Um, so I retired when I was, when was it, 2017? I retired for about a year. Didn't know what I was going to do. Started seeing all these ads on Instagram and Facebook from what I call the old sales gurus talking about, oh, you got to do this. And you got, you know, hustle, muscle and, you know, pressure, pressure, pressure. And I'm like, man, if I would have sold like that, I would have made 90% less what I did. I was like, none of that makes any sense. You know, my background in, in university was human behavior and psychology. So I was studying from, you know, psychologists from like, you know, NYU and Harvard. I'm just like this boring book nerd, right? So I was studying from like Robert Caldini here in Arizona State, you know, locally uh, here where I'm at and Daniel Pink. And I started, you know, in college started learning very early on that the most persuasive way to sell was over here. Whereas the guru books I was reading me and some of them behind me in those bookshelves were saying that was over here. It was like complete opposite. Like it never made any sense to me. So I'm like, how do I take the theory of behavioral science and, and psychology and wrap that into a sales process? How do I get my, and that's what I started doing. And that's when I started to learn how to get my prospects to pull me in rather than most salespeople have been taught to push and push and push. And when you learn how to get your prospects to pull you in and persuade themselves, selling becomes very, very easy and extremely profitable for sure. I love that. And before we get into that, though, I have to I have to give a couple of uh, shout outs now because, uh, Jeremy, what we, we, we learned uh, off air that we have something in common, but now we have two things in common because Tristan and I, Tristan's the founder of Lab Code Agents, uh, we always brag and say the year of 1977 is the greatest year in the history of the world because that's when great people were born. I believe you were also born in 1977. Yeah. We have that in common. Uh, yeah. But you also have a place at the Lake of the Ozarks. And everybody who knows me, especially in LabCode Agents, knows that that's a, yeah. a big passion of mine. Um, and so uh, I love that. So I have to let the audience know there's a, there's a special place in my heart now for this guy. There you go. So, Whenever I say I have a lake at the home, at the home of the Lake of the Ozarks, I'm like, it's like the, the Ozark show on Netflix, like the Jason <laughs> Bateman. They're like, oh, yeah, the Jason Bateman show. I'm like that's it's kind of like that kind of some kind of not really kind of not really I mean as as you know and I know where you're at at the lake it is the yeah. furthest thing from that show because that show depicts like mile marker seventy five not mile marker True. Like five yeah there's it depends on what marker you're on depends on if that show is actually reality or not some of some of that show is true some of it's not so true yes very much so very much so I love it man so 
So let's let's dig a little deep. So uh, first of all, I, I've got to I've got to pull pull back a little bit here and ask you. So you your your degree in in behavioral science, human psychology, when you were going to college, was that degree with the intent of getting into sales, or what? You know, kind of what led you down this path? Uh, it wasn't. Um, and just so you're aware, I dropped out my senior year. I still have 13 credits left. I know I was making so I was making like 10 times more than my professors teaching me that I'm like, why do I even need this? Because I got into I got into sales like my kind of the end of my junior year going into my senior year. And I, I started making all this money. And I'm just like, wait a minute, I have to go past college algebra and trigonometry. Like none of that makes sense. Like I'm never going to use that. So I just dropped out 13 credits shy. So I don't have a degree. Most people would say I probably know more than most of the professors they're teaching. But um, I got into behavioral science because actually that's what I was really geeked out on. Even in high school, I was I was into like why does a human being make a decision to do one thing or the other? Like, it's always fascinating me, like our, how our brains work. Like, why do we do go left instead of going right? And I, I feel like once you understand like certain parts of our brain and why we're wired to do things, you know, subconsciously and consciously, it, it just opens up a whole new world as a salesperson because you know why people are doing certain things. And you start to understand that here's the reason why I got this objection was not because of the prospect was because what you said triggered that objection. And once you start to eliminate that type of stuff, like I said, selling becomes very easy for sure. I love that, man. I mean, and I think, and I mentioned this in, in the beginning, which is understanding the psychology by which people do what they do. And, and we're doing that same thing as it relates to social media. You can see it's obviously a big, big part of my life and what we do. We're sure. studying Gen Z right now and, and understanding yeah. their habits and understanding why that they do what they do and, yeah. and how the world is evolving. Yeah. But, but how this affects the real estate world is, uh, you know, obviously very powerful because whether yeah. you like it or not, you're a salesperson. Uh, what you're selling, I think, is up to you and and how and how you kind of look at your 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 job. Well, how do you yeah. look at it as how do you look at real estate agents? How do you look at them as it relates to being called a salesperson? Well, it's how you're perceived by your prospects. So I'll give you an example. And this this is what always irritates me. And we train a ton of people in your industry, by the way. We train 158 different industries. I would say real estate agents are probably in the top 30 to 40. Uh, fields that we train in, just so you're aware. So one thing that always annoys me, even when I go to look at buying a property, is the real estate agents never really ask me really what I'm looking for. Or they might ask one question, and then they take me to a bunch of homes and they say, oh, I really like this kitchen, and I like this, and I like the way the master bedroom is, and you're going to love this, and I like this. And I'm like, well, I don't really care what you like. Um, maybe I care about what I like. And I never quite understand that by most real estate agents. And I'm not saying that that's a blanket statement that every real estate agent does that. But from my experience, most agents do, right? That don't really have much training. I, I see a lot of you know, people in most industries, especially agents, they don't really have training. They go through like, they take their test and they know all the ins and outs of the, you know, the doors and this law and that law, but they don't really understand the why behind a person even looking for a different home. Like, why are they even looking? Like, what's behind that, right? Is it because they want to be in a safer neighborhood? Well, what's behind that? Why do they even want to be in a safer neighborhood? What's happened in the past? Was it maybe something that even happened in their childhood that triggers a negative emotion and maybe there's more crime in their neighborhood now? Maybe it's a uh, social status. Maybe they moved up in the business world and they want to be recognized their peers, but most Real estate agents never find out those details. And because they don't find out those details, they don't stand out in the prospect's mind. So they don't stand out as being different. So like if you're at a networking event and somebody says, well, hey, what do you do for a living? And you're like, oh, I sell real estate or I'm a real estate agent. Well, what the hell does that mean to the prospect? Nothing. All that means is they just clump you in with all the other real estate agents they know. There's nothing that stands out about you. So instead of telling them, you know, I'm this, tell them how what you do helps other people. So you want to, we call that like a personalized introduction, like if you're at a networking event. So you might want to come up with two or three generic problems that most people you're talking to can associate with, and then how what you do solves those, you know? Might maybe an example, and I'm just throwing this off the tip of my tongue, but I might say, well, yeah, what I do is, you know how a lot of people get frustrated when they go to sell their home because of X and Y and Z, whatever X and Y and Z is, those three problems. Well, what we do is we help them buy, and then you go over how you solve X and Y and Z. 
Okay. And that makes you stand out in the prospect's mind. Like, oh, interesting. How do you do that? And now you're in a two-way conversation rather than them scurrying on to something else because they just grouped you with all these other agents they've always talked about to say the same thing. You with me? So you're saying that when it, when in a situation like that, and just yeah. generally speaking, somebody asks you what you do for a living, you're su suggesting that they answer it. They change the entire narrative of how they answer the question. Well, if you want to, if you want to make a lot of sales, you might want to for sure. If you don't care about getting listings, then you you don't. It doesn't matter. Give me, give me some more examples. Give, give me some more examples of what you're talking about on how you might introduce yourself as a real estate agent. So give me, give me two, you do this for me, Jeff. Give me like two generic problems that most of your prospects have. Okay. Right that, now. That most people would know about. They get frustrated or about what? When I mean, right, buying a home. Right now, uh, it, it, it as a buyer, lack of inventory. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. And also, and then you can also, another big, obviously industry issue right now issue is interest rates. Okay. But how do you solve that? You can't solve interest rates, uh, so but you bring up something them. that you can solve. Well, you can educate them as to why that shouldn't be the reason why you choose not to buy right now. Okay. But you can't, okay. But education goes in one ear out the other because you're biased. You're the real estate agent. You're trying to get a listing and a sale, true, right? True. They know that you're biased, right? So education is great, but it doesn't mean it's going to stick in their brain. So we need to come up with two generic problems that most people have and how what you do solves those. Maybe there's a marketing method you have that brings in more buyers. Maybe you have a bigger social media presence. Could that be one there, thing? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. So you know how a lot of people sometimes get frustrated when they're selling their house because of what? Give me a reason because of what? Uh, let's see. There could be a number of reasons. I would say probably from a buyer's or a homeowner's perspective is, uh, you know, not getting the price that you feel is what the house is worth. Yeah. So you know how a lot of homeowners get frustrated because when they go to sell their property, they always get lowballed by all these low offers and they what? What's another problem? Usually you want to have two generic problems. Uh, along the same vein? Anything. You just uh, let's talk about a seller right now, not even a buyer. Okay. Uh, well, I would say that would be one of them. Uh, two would be, you, gosh, I mean. As, Put me as, on the spot, baby. Yeah, you are. You are. Uh, I, I would say probably, you know, like going back to what you said, uh, as a seller is finding the right agent who yeah. isn't going to be uh, obviously driving their decisions based on just getting a quick commission and selling the house. Okay. Really so, fast. so, okay. So that could be, is that what a prospect really sets around thinking about? Maybe I'd say one of the biggest problems is they maybe are getting lower ball offers now compared to maybe what they were a year ago. Right. So we want to some, have something that's relevant. So you know how a lot of, of, of homeowners sometimes get frustrated because they put their home up for sale thinking it's all beautiful and everything, but then they start getting all these low ball offers from, you know, XYZ, you know, buyers and they, whatever you just said, and they don't feel like their agent does X and Y and Z. So what we do is we help homeowners like that by bringing in, how do you help them solve the, the lowball offers by, by our social media presence that brings in more, what type of buyer? See, we got to have something that ties that back in. I'm, I'm making a personalized intro for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tell me. I, mean, I get it. I get what you're saying. Uh, and I think that as anybody listening to this, they're thinking to themselves, okay, how can I make this applicable to me? Um, because it, here's my first inclination on when you start started to explain that, which I, I totally get it. It makes a total sense. But my first reaction was, all right, that sounds corny. Like, just just mm -hmm. don't bullshit me. Just tell me what you do for a living. Uh, but I get what you're saying. Whereas yeah, now I'm like, sudden, I sell real estate. Well, yeah. It doesn't mean anything. It just goes in one area. You just became commoditized. Like there's no, you want them to view you as like an authority or an expert in your field. Mm -hmm. So you want to tell them how what you do helps other people, but you don't want that to be like 10 paragraphs because that sounds like a sales pitch. You want to keep that small. Well, interesting that you said that. What I do is, you know how a lot of homeowners now are getting frustrated by the high interest rates uh, and they're getting frustrated by putting their home up for sale and they're just getting all these low ball offers, something short. And you nod your head. They're like, yeah, yeah. Well, what I do is, is we help them by, and then how do you help them? See, that's what you got to plug in the gap. So what we do is we help them by our social media presence, like bringing in more of a sophisticated, higher net worth buyer that's actually looking for that type of home in that zip code or whatever you say. And then at the end of that, like, do you, uh, and then you ask them like a question at the end, like, 
Um, are you, do you have your home up for sale now or, or are you just staying in your home or something? You want, and want to ask some type of question at the end that takes the focus back off you and puts it on them. But you want to keep that to like two to three sentences. Because if you start going to six paragraphs, then it does sound corny and like a sales pitch. But if you keep it small and like swift, like boom, 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 it triggers your prospect to become what? Curious, right? So you want them to become curious where it starts a two-way conversation, right? Otherwise, you say, I'm a real estate agent. I sell real estate. Oh, okay. It goes in one ear out the other. They just commoditized you with everybody else that says they're a real estate agent too. There's no difference about you. Can I summarize what you're describing right now is by saying agents need to do a better job of really dialing in their value proposition and kind of niching down to some very specific, uh, you know, topics or specialties yeah. rather than value proposition is good, but you got to be careful by just saying your solution because nobody cares. If you focus on one or two generic problems that most of them can identify with, and then the value proposition on how you solve that it clicks the more of the emotional dots with the prospect rather than you just talking about the value you bring because nobody cares about your value. What they do care about is what? Their problems, their yeah. frustrations, yeah. Their, their anxiety, their stress, right? That's what they care about. But you definitely want to bring the value proposition, but you don't want to bring that in first where you're just talking about the value you bring because nobody gives a rat's ASS, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're biased. You're the salesperson and they know that. So it, it starts with actually identifying the problem uh, and then following just, it up. Yeah, just two to three generic problems that most of your prospects would identify with. Now, what would they identify with right now in your market? Okay, high interest rates. They would identify with low ball offers. What's the third thing they might identify with? Uh, seller you're talking about? Well, seller or buyer. I mean, buyer well, probably be different. Buyer is going to be low inventory, just a lack okay. of opportunity, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you talk, so you know, a lot of uh, homeowners, right? You know how a lot of people out there are getting frustrated because they just can't find a home because of the low inventory and they, what would be the next problem? Mm -hmm. You just plug in one or two generic problems where they're like, yeah, see, they're like nodding their head. Like, yeah, I know about it. Even if they're not going through it, they know other people that are going through it or they've read about it. Everybody knows yeah, about it, right? Yeah, the fe fear so of a recession, fear of what's to come. And they're you're identifying with them with what they're already thinking. So that automatically attracts them to you a lot more and where they start to view you differently than everybody else that does the same thing you do. You always want to stand out. If you don't stand out, Nobody cares. Differentiation, man. It's uh, that's a that's a cliche, but also so powerful and 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 a word that everybody just doesn't identify with because we all just tend to lean towards blending in versus differentiating. I think a lot of people when they hear that we're different, and they're like, oh, uh, and they talk about how their solutions different or how their services are different. Oh, oh, we have better this and we have better that and we have the best this. But here's the deal. Your prospects are used to every salesperson who's ever tried to sell them anything saying what? We have the number one product. We have the number one service. Here's how we different. They're used to you talking down about your competition. And when you say things like that, all it does psychologically is it triggers your prospects to actually trust you less because they're used to every salesperson always saying the same thing. So they don't view you any differently. Okay. So you want to downplay that. So you got the biggest thing we have to learn is how to disarm a prospect, how to get them to let their guard down where they become open to what we're talking about. Because if we can't get them to engage with this and become open and go below the surface, even the very best questions you're going to ask are just going to stay what? They're going to stay surface level because they've emotionally shut down because they know that your questions are just there to try to propel them into, you know, making a sale or, or getting a listing with you or whatever. So you gotta be careful with that. It's interesting. It's interesting because I think a lot of a well, first of all, I don't think many agents actually even really think too deep into this. And you mentioned it. They get into real estate. They really don't have proper training. The whole licensing process really has nothing to do with selling. It has nothing. And so and so right. and then and then it really just it, your success oftentimes is attributed to who you choose to join underneath, who is going to be your mentor slash teacher. And most of those people, no offense, suck. And Not so, yeah, yeah. They're I mean, just making money because they've got 15 agents underneath them. Right, right. They were a top salesman and got lifted up into a quote unquote managerial uh, status and, and really don't have sure. any managerial skill. So, yeah. you know, if, if I'm an agent sitting here listening to this right now, I mean, I think we're we're turning over some 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 rocks here that 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 are powerful. Like, I think if you're sitting back and thinking and listening to this, you're like, 
well, shit, like I'm guilty. I'm yeah. guilty, but, but how do I overcome? And I, even myself, Jeremy, <laughs> I, I consider myself pretty eloquent, somebody who can easily rattle things off and you've already stumped me. Um, and so well, here's, here's one thing that, that we all have to understand. All right. So within the first, just, this is just behavioral science 101 and everybody look, if, if we want to understand why you're not really where you're wanting to be financially in, in real estate or, or mortgages or whatever you sell, it's not because it's your prospect's fault. It's because what we're saying and or not asking is triggering your prospects you're already talking to to run the other way. Now, that could be changed once you learn the right things to say, once you learn the right questions to ask with the right tone. So one thing we all want to get, wrap our mind around is within typically within the first seven to 12 seconds of any sales interaction you're in, okay, uh, whether you're in person, whether you're calling on the phone, whether you've got a Zoom appointment, it doesn't really matter if you're in the office, okay, your prospects uh, subconsciously, we can't even help it as a human being. We are picking up on your social cues. Like when you go to an event and you start talking with somebody, what do you first start doing in the first 10 seconds? What do you notice your mind is doing when somebody comes up and talks to you? You're asking me personally? Yeah. When you, when somebody comes up and talks to you at a networking event, what are you starting to assess within that first 10 to 15 seconds? Well, for me, uh, it's uh, I'm trying to listen. Uh, so I, I'm looking for a cue so or, or something that they say that will allow me to ask them your, a follow-up question. Your, your brain is automatically, subconsciously viewing their social, you're, you're reading their social cues. You just said it. That's not something that you learn. That's something that instinctively we do as human beings. It goes all the way back to you know, whenever the first humans were put on here, but no, nobody really knows the exact date or time, right? But our part of our brain is called the reptilian part of our brain uh, was was basically trained from an early time that we have to protect ourselves from people who are, are things, animals that are harmful to us, right? So we had to look for social cues from that tiger or that rhino or whatever, because we have to protect ourselves. Now, later on, right, we've evolved with that because now our brains are trying to protect, uh, we're trying to protect ourselves from what? Salespeople trying to sell us something, right? Am I right? Because we're always sold all the time. We see commercials, you know, on the TV trying to sell us. We turn on the radio. We hear people trying to sell us. We get on social media. We see ads trying to sell us. We drive down the road. We see billboards trying to sell us. We are continually being sold 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Because of that, human beings have built walls of resistance. Then anytime we feel someone is trying to sell us something, we do what? We emotionally shut down and we try to get rid of that salesperson, okay? So they're picking up on your verbal and nonverbal cues based on your tonality and what you're saying and asking that triggers the brain to react in one of two ways, okay? So if we come across in our conversations aggressive, if we come across needy, everybody knows what I mean by that. Everybody's been guilty. You come across needy, you come across attached and you don't understand the right questions asked. You don't understand the right tone. It triggers the brain to go into what's called fight or flight mode. Now, everybody's heard fight or flight mode, but do you understand what triggers a brain to do that? It's not like somebody just goes into it. There's something you say or ask that triggers them to respond that way. And that's where the prospect tries to get rid of you, right? Like if you're calling expired listings or, you know, whatever you're doing and the process is like, oh, no, I'm good. I'm not interested. You, you could have told them they just won $1 billion. And you've already triggered fight or flight mode where they're just trying to get rid of you. They don't even know what you're doing, right? They didn't even listen to anything you said, all right? Now, when we come across, when we learn, and we can talk about this and say, we learn what's called neuroemotional persuasion questions. When we learn how to disarm a prospect, to let their guard down, and we come across more neutral. And when I say neutral, that means like we're unbiased. Like we're not quite sure if we can even help yet because we don't know anything about their situation, okay? When we come across more collective, when we come across more detached, that's the key word, detached, and we understand the right questions to ask, we understand the right tone, it triggers the human brain to become curious enough where they actually want to engage, okay? They, they want to open up to us because they don't know what it is yet, but they feel like you might have something that could be important to them. So we have to learn how to become more detached from the, let's say, expectations of getting the listing in this case, or making the sale, and really instead focus on whether or not they have problems that you can actually help them solve. Now, do I mean when you get on a sales call that it's not your goal to make the sale or make the appointment or get the listing? 
Well, obviously not, right? Your goal in every single conversation is to move that forward, but you have to keep that to yourself because the moment your prospect feels that you're just trying to sell them is the moment they do what? They emotionally shut down. You with me on that? 100%. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and that and that takes me back to the fact that myself in the real estate industry, I tell all realtors and stand on stages and tell big, large crowds of people, you're the worst spammers of any industry in the world. Yeah. And and I don't think many real estate agents look at themselves that way. And and by spam, I'm I'm also meaning like we're I hate to say this, but in many cases, it, it's like used car salesmen. And I know it's a, a it's an old cliche statement, but everybody knows what that means. Yeah. And that is you walk onto a car lot and they just pounce on you, right? But in reality, like you're saying is that we as a real estate industry, we could be at our, our our kids' dance lesson. We could be at church. I mean, you mentioned a networking event, which is a little bit different because it's more business-minded, but sure. a lot of us are so guilty of everywhere we go yeah. vomiting what yeah. we do. And well, yeah, let me give you an example. I'll just, you know, I was doing a training call for a, a, um, a big firm that has a, a ton of agents in San Antonio the other day. And what their biggest problem was they had to do all these open houses everywhere, all these open houses, new construction. And the prospect comes in. And what's the first thing out of the real estate agent's mouth most of the time? Hey, welcome in. How can we help you? Yeah. And what does the average prospect say? Just looking. Just looking. Yeah. I'm just looking. Yeah. And then it's done. It's over. At hello. But this is so easy because what you want to do is you want to do what we call objection prevention. So rather than objection handling, why not prevent the objections from even happening in the prospect's mind? So let's just tell them the objection right when they walk in. Now, we don't tell them in a weird way. I know you're just looking. <laughs> no. Let me show you what you do. So typically, and this, this works for any type of retail establishment or anytime somebody's walking into you, okay? So you just meet them with the objection. Hey, welcome into the house today. Are you guys just all out looking around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. And do you know, do you know what you're possibly looking for? And boom, you're right into your first connecting question. See, I've already given them the objection. They can't give me the objection. So it doesn't end there. Hey, welcome into the, the to the to the home today. Are you guys just all at, are you guys just out looking around today? Yeah, yeah. We're just, yeah, we're out looking around. Oh, okay. And do you guys know what you're possibly looking for? And boom, we go right into what's called our first connecting questions. It just eliminates the objection. It's easy. Mm, yeah. That's powerful. Uh, I don't think many people think about, think about that. And for those of you listening, there there uh, there's there's a lot of takeaways here. But that's a powerful one. You might want to think about it if you want to make a lot of money mm -hmm. in sales. It mm -hmm. might be important. I'm just saying, like if you're a neurosurgeon, you probably want to learn how to do the most effective surgery because then you get paid the most. Yeah. So if you're a real estate agent or you're selling mortgage or any type of sales you might want to learn how to persuade the most effectively because then you get paid the most. Yeah, You're already going to work the same hours. Why not get paid five times more? I don't know. Yeah. Call me crazy. Yes, you're crazy in a good crazy. way, though, of course. You know, so let's, uh, you know, I, I like that so much. Uh, can we try to find another example to also give? So you mentioned uh, the open house. Let's take that one step further. And how would you then carry on uh, that conversation now that you beat down and, and eliminated the, the objection that they were going to say. So you go right in your first connecting question. Yeah, we're just, yeah, we're just looking. Oh, okay. And do you know, do you know what you're possibly looking for? Now notice how my cadence slows down because if I just say, do you know what you're looking for? Oh, I'm not, I'm not really sure. See, that's a fast question. It's a knee jerk question. You're going to get a knee jerk reaction because it doesn't cause them to think deep about what you're asking. But if I slow it down with my cadence and my tone, really important. If I say, well, do you know, do you know what you're possibly looking for? Well, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So I was just curious, because there's a lot of open houses around here. What caused you to come in this house over like some of the others on XYZ block? That's just another connecting question. Well, the reason why we came by this house is we really like the lawn. And see, now we're getting them to focus on why they even came in the first place. Okay. Ah, I see. And then what do you, um, Maybe walk me through, like, what type do you own or do you rent a home right now? Oh, you guys own a home. Okay. And what type of home do you have? Now I'm walking through what are called situation questions. Okay. Situation questions help me, the salesperson, and most importantly, the prospect find out what their real situation is. Because if they already own a home, why are they looking to 
buy a different home. Most real estate agents don't ever find that out. And because you don't find out what's behind the drive, behind the why, you're just setting yourself up for them to go look at six or seven other agents and entertain other agents as well. There's no competitive advantage you're going to have. So then I'm going to say, okay, and what, um, what, what type of home do you have now though? Oh, okay. And how many bedrooms? Okay. So I'm just getting some facts in my situation questions, because here's what we have to do, Jeff. If we can't help the prospect see what their real situation is, because most of your prospects don't even know what their real situation is when you first start talking to them. They might have an idea, but they don't know the full extent. They don't know the consequences of what will happen if they don't do anything about their changing their situation, okay? So if we don't understand what their situation is and they don't understand what their real situation is, how do you build a gap from where they currently are? We call that their current state to where they want to be. We call that their objective state. If you can't help them find out what the real situation is, you cannot build a gap in their mind. If you can't build a gap in their mind from where they are compared to where they want to be, guess what happens? You don't get the listing. You don't make the sale. Mm -hmm. Those are just a few examples. What about, let me give you another one. What about when they're going into a listing presentation and nine times out of 10, you go into a listing presentation, you know you're probably up against another agent or two. And so what, how would you handle that versus, you know, well, what I'm going to build a gap because I know that none of the other agents know how to do that. Go on. What, what are the other agents going to do when they come in? They're going to teach them why they have the best marketing, why they have yes. the best buyers, and they sound like everybody else. Yep. They don't know how to build a gap. So when I come in and I find out what their current situation is, what type of house they have, what, what do they like about the home? What would they change if they could? And really, what's the reasons why they're even looking for a home in the first place? Because maybe, who knows? Maybe it's because they want social status. Maybe it's an emotional need that the main breadwinner of the house is trying to get in their mind where they're like, you know what? I was really poor in high school. I didn't have anything. I've I've made all this success in the business world. I need to show everybody how successful I am by moving in that neighborhood. Well, that's not really solving a problem because the problem would be a roof over their head, right? So the rain doesn't get in their face. You're really solving more of an emotional need. Now, on the flip side, let's say it's a, a family that lives in certain parts of where you live in St. Louis that are pretty dangerous, right? But now they're like, hey, we got to get out of here because the crime's really bad. We want to move over to the suburban area. That's solving more of a problem because they don't want to get shot, right? So we have to find out those type of situations, right? The question, so we know how to build the gap from there. Because we can't find that out, we can't build a gap. There's no sale. So let's go back to the first example where you said you're not necessarily solving a problem. You know, what is your response or reaction to that to then kind of, you know, win them over essentially? Well, we're not winning them over. We're finding, we're basically getting them to win over the fact on why they want us to list their home. Right. right? So we're, we're getting them to persuade themselves on why we're the best option for them, why it's less risky for them to hire us and go with our services than it is to go with their neighbor or their uncle or, or whatever that might not get the, what they want for their home. So like I said, it's all about building the gap, right? So we're not just going in there with a the pitch on why we have the best because every other real estate agent is also doing what? Yes, Giving them a pitch on why they're the best. So all that is is just like one ear out the other. And now your personality is selling, all right? Maybe you win some people, but then you also lose a lot of other people when your personality is selling, okay? So when you build the gap, when you're asking like certain situation questions to find out what they currently have right now, let's say they already own a home. Well, you know, what type of home do they have? What type of bedrooms? And help me understand, just so I can see the rationale, but besides, you know, wanting to get more room because you have three kids now, like what, what's the main reason why you're looking for more of this exclusive neighborhood, you know, over here in Deer Valley, rather than moving over here to the, to the east side of town? Well, the reason why I'm looking for a home in Deer Valley is because of X and because of Y and because of Z. See, now they've told themselves and you two or three other reasons why they want to look in that, in that neighborhood. And when the, the more they tell themselves why they want to look for that house, they're giving them more reasons in their mind, the bigger the what? The bigger the gap becomes. OK, if you can't, like I said, if you can't build the gap, there's no sale there. So if they just tell you one reason why they're looking to change, is that as powerful or persuasive as if they tell you and themselves four or five other reasons why they want to change? Everybody knows that answer. But then how does that make them more, uh, more, more likely to choose you as their agent just because you're filling those gaps? Or because you, the because gap? when you're when you're building the gap, 
what they're doing is they're emotionally, you're getting them into what's called their emotional state. You're triggering emotional triggers that no other real estate agent knows how to trigger. And if you're the one triggering that, what do they, what, how do they view you? They view you as more of the expert, the trusted authority who's going to get them the best result. They view everybody else as just another real estate agent trying to, to sell them a home. And because they view them that way, they're never going to go with somebody who they don't feel understands their unique situation. Tell me this. When you go to buy a product or service after meeting with several salespeople and companies, who do you typically buy from? The person that you feel understands your unique situation the most or some person that just kind of gave you a generic cookie cutter presentation? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. And it's the person it's, you feel most connected to. 100%. You feel most connected with them because they've triggered emotional drivers. They've gotten you into their emotional state. If they stay logical, if you stay logical with a salesperson, people, do people, human beings make decisions on logic or emotion? It's a hundred percent emotion. Brain studies prove that. There's no debate in the, in the behavioral science world about that point. So the problem is, is that most salespeople in large, especially real estate agents, don't know how to get the prospect to go below the surface. They just ask a few generic questions. So what are you looking for in a home and how many bedrooms do you want? Okay, well, let me show you these 10 different options. Yeah. And that's the extent of it. They never find out what's behind the why of why they're even looking to make a change. Would you would you say, so, I mean, this is obviously a very sales specific conversation. And, and one of the things that we talk about when it comes to marketing, especially as it relates to social media is it's, it's, it's the same general concept, which is, never sell, you know, come from authenticity, attract because people are going to be able to relate to you and they have something in common with you. And then the one, the one objection or question that we get a lot is as we're coaching and teaching is, okay, well, what's my call to action? And I'm going to ask you this because from my experience and, and um, expertise doing what I do is I rarely actually even call, have a call to action because it just attracts itself. It's, it's one of those things where you give, 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 and it comes back to you 10 X kind of thing. I have a feeling you're going to have a different response to that because I, I do. Yeah, you have a sales be, mind. It has, it has to be, it has to be a persuasive call to action where they don't feel like you're making the call to action to sell them. They feel like you're making the call to action to help them solve their problems and get what they want, right? Okay. So let's say that we might make, as a sales training company, we might make a call to action. Let's say if we're on a Facebook Live to a thousand people, okay? And, you know, we- Well, let's be honest. It's usually five people. It, well, it depends on how big your social media is. Yeah, true, but still, let's just be honest. It's not usually a thousand Okay, people. so let's say if you're a real estate agent, you've got a low social media profile. Let's say you've got 10 people on live. Mm -hmm. So what, you don't want to give a call to action every single time you go live every day because that, that that means they, they just look at you as like a pitch person. Yeah. But like once every four or five times when you go live, you might say that now, if you're looking to you know work with an, an agent who's going to get you the highest value of your home with and take out all the the heartache, you know, DM me directly right now. I'm right here. DM me directly right now. And if you want, we can schedule a short call to see what you're looking for to see if we can actually help you or something like that. But it, it shouldn't be every single time you go live, probably once every four or five times. It's got to be more strategic because if it's not strategic and it's just all the time or you're just winging it all the time, you're just not going to get the same results. You, you hear that audience and and we say the same thing about your social posts. It should be one out of five is actual business. The rest should just be the reason why people are there in the first place. Uh, yeah. But this applies. I, obviously, you are you're just said it yourself. I mean, as you're marketing yourself, you should not be vomiting uh, CTAs because it, as you're doing that, you just come off as a, as a spammer, as a salesperson. Not every, not every single post. And you have to you have to come across when you do it as a way where they feel like you're helping them solve their problems. Like you don't want to come across as like some like quote unquote, and we train a lot of used car dealerships that do really well now, but you don't want to come across in that stereotypical used car. You know, I'm just here to pitch you something. So you buy something for me. Right. So like we might train on something for 30 minutes on one of our Instagram or, or Facebook lives. We have big Facebook groups. You know, we've got a big Instagram following now. And so we'll go live. We'll have, you know, five, six, seven, 800 people on there on those lives. And at the end of that, I might say, now, look, if you're if you're wanting, because what I just gave you today is just a little nibble. I, I just gave you a couple little hors d'oeuvres. But if you're wanting, if you're a salesperson, you're wanting to, if you want to start making your first 10 grand a month in commissions, like every month, or if you want to start making your first 15 or 20 or even 25 or 30,000 in commissions every single month with what you sell now, message me directly right now.
you know, message me directly. And see, that's just a small call to action. I'm saying if you want to, and I repeat back what they want, message me directly now. See, I'm not saying, hey, if you want to buy our training program, message me directly right now. I'm not selling them a sales training program. I'm selling them what? The results of what that sales training will do for them, which is to make them more money. That's what you're selling. You're not selling the thing. You're selling them the results of that thing. Same thing when you, they buy a house. You're not selling them a home. You're selling them the results of what that home is going to do for them. Maybe it's to give them a higher social status. That's what they want. Or maybe it's to give them a fifth bedroom because now they have so many kids and they were living in an apartment. That's what you're selling. You're selling the results of what that thing does, not the thing itself. When you start to understand the difference, everything pretty much opens up. One last question before we wrap up, because we're running, we're running against the clock here, is uh, we, you know, we used several examples, but let's use a, a lead as an example, because it's very common in our industry, you know, Zillow, obviously, and, and uh, you know, Realtor.com and those sorts of things. What is the approach to a lead? Because I think that the, the that our brain is trained to think, okay, we this is a lead. It speeds a lead. I have to sell fast. What is your coaching or training to the real estate agent who's buying leads and how they should better approach these leads in order to convert more? Well, first of all, you can't just believe in your mind because they've responded to some real estate thing that and they're selling leads to you and 10 other realtors that they're right. just automatically ready to buy. You can't go in there like assuming that because you're going to get slapped in the face and punched in the nose pretty damn hard, which everybody knows listening to me, right? So <clears throat> we want to do, that's considered like an outbound lead for us. Like you're calling somebody who's requested information. So just off the top of my head, it might be something like, hey, is this Jane? Uh, hey, Jane, it's just... Um, uh, 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 Jeff, I'm just going to make up a name. It's just, it's Jeff, it's just Jeff Grover. It looks like you had... Uh, responded to one of our ads a couple of hours ago about possibly looking at a couple of different homes, the 55 Willow and the 650 Willow. And I just had time to get back to you to see if I could help. Is this an appropriate time? Now notice how I'm calm and I'm relaxed and I'm low key. Now, why would I want to be calm, relaxed and low key? Why would I not want to be really excited? Mm -hmm. What's the difference? I mean, I think that being really excited almost makes you look a little bit more desperate, makes you look a little bit more aggressive. Needy makes mm -hmm. you, it, it triggers, what it does in the prospect's brain is it triggers fight or flight mode because mm -hmm. they're used to every salesperson being really excited that they're talking to you, right? So I want to be low key and relaxed because when you're low key and relaxed, people start to do what? Relax themselves. It's not hard, everybody. It's, a, is, it's mirroring, right? I just mean, behavioral science 101. When I'm low key and relaxed, prospects become more relaxed. When I'm high strung and excited, they get high strung and go into fight or flight mode because they know that you're a salesperson trying to sell them something. Okay. Now, I, I, I guess I, I know you just responded to the ad, but I should probably start up and say, have you found what you're looking for? Or are you still possibly looking for a home in this neighborhood? Now, I always give them the, the uh, ability to say no. Now, why would, oh my gosh, Jeremy, why would I ever want to give a prospect the ability to say no? Why not just push them into saying yes and what I want them to say? Why would I do that? I think you're making them feel comfortable. It triggers them to let their guard down because when you admit that you might not be able to help them, okay, because you don't know enough about what they're even looking for yet, your prospects will let their guard down. And if you can't get them to let their guard down, if they stay with the wall up the whole time, you get surface level answers and then they say, oh, this sounds good. Let me think it over. I need to do more research. I'm talking to more agents. I'll get back to you if we're interested. And how many of those people ever get back to you? Like yeah. zero, mm -hmm. right? So the thing is we want to disarm them, okay? No, no, I'm still looking. Okay, and do you know, do you know what you're looking for? Well, I'm looking for X and Y and Z. Okay, yeah, and really this first call, it's pretty basic. It's more for us to find out more about kind of you know, maybe what you have now, as far as the home you guys have and, and what that kind of looks like compared to what you're looking for in like another home to see what the gap kind of looks like, mm -hmm. just to make sure we can help. And then towards the end of the call, Jane, if you feel that, you know, that it, it might be one of these homes might be what you're looking for. Um, we can talk about uh, possible next steps. Would that help you? Nobody's going to say, no, it would not help me to 
talk about possible next steps. See how I neutralize that. I didn't say at the end of the call, we can sign a listing agreement and I'm going to be your real estate agent because that's over assumptive. You, they don't even know, there's no trust built there. And towards the end of the call, if you feel that one of these homes might be what you're looking for, notice I said might be what you're looking for. We can talk about possible next steps. Possible, see, it's neutral. You're not mm -hmm. triggering in resistance. The main thing is you don't want to trigger sales resistance or it's over, okay? And then I say, would that help you? You know what everybody's going to say? Yeah, that would help me. And then I'm going to go right into my first situation question. That would That's what you do for sure. We got real estate agents that came to us making 50 grand a year that now make twice that every single month. Yeah, <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. Um, and then the last thing I'll say on that too, or ask you is the same conversation we had about the open house, which is they walk in, you're taking the objection of what everybody says right out of their mouth. Would you suggest trying to do the same thing with a lead, which is typically... I didn't click on that or I'm just browsing. I was just looking and wanted to look at more. I'm not really looking to buy. Would you suggest that as a possible technique to remove that objection that you know is coming immediately out of their mouth? Uh, it just it just depends on kind of their tone in the beginning. But typically, if they're like, oh, I was just if I say so when you went through the ad where you saw the the home, what was it about the home that attracted your attention? Now, most of the time, because I'm focused on the home, they're going to tell me. Now, oh, I liked this about this. Or let's say they could. You could have some people like, well, I was just browsing. Oh, yeah, that's pretty normal. Do you know what you're possibly browsing for? I just yeah. agree with them. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's pretty normal. Do you know what you're browsing for? And I'm right back into the same question. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I hear from you is, is you're really making the prospect comfortable. You're making them feel like they actually want to talk to you more rather than Because that's where off. trust is built. Yeah. Yeah. People do not buy from people they just like. That is a myth. I love the Dale Carnegie book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. The problem is it was, it was written in 1936. Your prospects are much different now than they were in 1936. Yeah. Yeah. We live in the information age where your prospects are bombarded by information. They are so distracted. In 1936, they would just take a phone call. The phone was brand new. They would take it. They didn't know who was calling. They'd answer every single phone call. Times are different. So people buy from people who they feel can get them the best result, not just who they like. If they like you, that's just a bonus. Yeah. Like, you know, it's not like you love uh, Amazon. Like, oh, I just love Jeffrey Bezos. He's the rich, one of the richest persons in the world. You, you might not like him and his company, but you're going to buy from him over the local retail store because Amazon gets you a better result. You solve the problem. See? You solve yeah. the problem. So people mm -hmm. buy based off who they feel can get them the best result, not just on who they like or is the coolest. That's just a bonus. If they like you, it's just a bonus, but it's not the reason why they buy from you. Yeah. Just well, that, that, that's why it's got to be more than just like, it's got to be no and trust as well. You got to add those in there. hundred percent. You can only build trust, not by asking them how the weather is or who won the game last night or how they're doing today. Cause every process, every salesperson asks that at the beginning of a call and they know you're generally interested in how their damn day's going. Let's just be honest. Right. So that just mm -hmm. triggers more resistance. So Trust can only be built by the questions you ask them and how you get them to open up. And your tone has a big deal that actually triggers them to actually want to open up. Because I can ask the same questions, but in a different tone, and I'm going to get a different result for sure. Jeremy, you know who needs this in the real estate world as much as anybody is those uh, is the agents and those of you listening to this. If you're at EXP or you're at Real, or you're at one of those uh, you're one of those brokerages where you've got recruiting breath. This is this is a podcast. Mission breath. To. Commission yeah. breath. Hashtag commission breath. Did, yeah, commission breath. Yeah. I love it, man. I mean, you you need to you need to surround yourself with more Jeremy Miners. So, Jeremy, on that vein, what is the best way? I know you guys got a Facebook group. What is the best yeah. way for people to I mean, get into best, your bubble? Yeah, the best way to kind of learn about what we do. If they want some like free resources to find out more, just have them join our free Facebook group. It's uh salesrevolution.pro. So have them go to salesrevolution.pro. Got about 37, 38,000 uh, folks in there. A lot of them are agents as well, just different sales professionals and entrepreneurs. And right when they join, uh, have them check their messenger on Facebook. Somebody on my team will message them over a free training called the NEPQ 101 mini course. It's our, my CEO, Matt Ryder, will break down what's called neuro emotional persuasion questions. And he'll give them some example questions that they can probably just use some of those that will automatically help them get more listings and more sales quicker. Okay. And then we go live in the Facebook group three or four times a week, different trainings, different Q and A. So we'll give them little nibbles, little hors d'oeuvres. And if they want more advanced, you know, training that our clients go through, 
uh, they can just always message us in that group and they can book a call with one of our team members if they if they want to learn more and acquire more skills. But with having started in the Facebook group. Where do you put out the most content on which platform? Uh, Facebook groups and IG. We got a couple hundred thousand followers on our IG account. Uh, so yeah, IG and um, and the Facebook group. Where That's can they find you on Instagram? Uh, my handle is Jeremy Lee Miner, M I N E R. Uh, make sure you fo don't follow the spam accounts. There's always spam accounts out there. So mm -hmm. that one, uh, I think, has 214, 215,000 followers, some somewhere in that range. So make sure they follow there. And I'd awesome. go to the Facebook group, probably the best place. Awesome. And and if they want to uh, get their hands on your book, uh, uh, when is that? Is that you can out? Pre order it now. You can pre order it now on Amazon. It won't be in bookstores like Barnes and Nobles, bookstores near you guys or airports that gets launched March 15th of 2023, but they can pre-order it now online. I believe the online version is available right before Christmas. If they want to get the physical copy in a bookstore like Barnes and Noble, they have to wait till March 15th. That's what will be in bookstores. Awesome. Jeremy, this has been a, it's been a pleasure. I wish we had more time, but I know you've got to run and go do a bunch more of these today. So I appreciate your, I appreciate your time, man. It's been great. I hope we can definitely stay in touch. Thanks, Jeff. Agents Podcast.